conducting marketing activities. So these, um, uh, in particular, when we when we talk about uh, just one second, let me just. Uh, so these that uh, you know, activities. yeah, no, I've got it here. So when we look at you know the contemporary issues in particular, when we talk about contemporary issues in digital marketing, uh, we need to be able to understand what does this particular uh, you know phrase mean. This is of importance as far as you know this learning outcome is concerned because when we i know that this unit is all about digital media marketing digital and social media marketing but what we also want to be able to do is relate to some of the content or the tools and techniques that we normally use uh, for traditional marketing and what are the contemporary issues that we normally see when we talk about digital marketing uh you know challenges in particular and there are four assessment criteria. There is a little bit of uh, content that uh, you know we need to address from a point of view of understanding. Sometimes you would have heard about these terms like you know the business sells B two B, or the business is D two C. The business is B two C, B two B, D two C, C two C. There are lots of these different types of terms. Have you come across these terms? Uh, I have, but I don't know what they mean. All right. Okay. So basically, these are acronyms, you know, when we talk about how does the business position or sell its services to consumers. So when we say D2C, it stands for direct to consumer. When we talk about B2B, that is business to business. When we say B2C, these are usual terms that uh, we normally come across. B2C is business to consumer. That means a business sells most of its products and services to an end customer directly. There is also what is called, um, you know, other terms which typically come across and they would be like C2C sometimes when consumers are selling to consumers. So if you're on a, uh, you know, like a auction platform like eBay or some of the platforms which are related to e-commerce when websites have it, sometimes what you would generally see is that these are terms which normally are used. So G2G is government to government business transactions. G2B is government to business. That means the government is representing or doing transactions which are going to be with a business organization g2c tends well, to will be a good example of b2b business to business so business to business would be say for example when you look at companies which produce <clears throat> you know um products and are working in the primary sector that means they make use of material which is mined from the earth so things like companies which are basically mostly construction production companies they produce for example cement um, so they will extract raw material from the earth and then they will create a product called cement and that cement will be sold to construction companies or other businesses which will be looking at developing residential uh, you know, developments or offices or blocks, commercial blocks, things like that. When you look at cars, for example, BMW, when it sells its cars, it will be buying a lot of products which are coming from different other companies like bodies, chassis, tires. So they are also businesses and they are selling in turn to another business which then work on the product convert it into a finished product and then sell to a customer so b2b is an example wherein a business is selling to a business they might be selling a semi-finished product a finished product and then that company would be buying it further uh, you know finishing the product or working on it and then convert and sell it to a consumer which is the end customer, the intended end recipient, and they would be termed as uh, you know, B2C. So these terms are used sometimes when we talk about segmentation. And when we talk about segmentation in terms of, you know, when we say, you know, segmentation is basically looking at you trying to understand your own customer uh, from a point of view of understanding what their needs and requirements and demands are. So when we talk about segmentation generally, you are generally going to see that it's a process through which we'll broadly divide the consumer on the basis of certain uh, you know aspects or attributes, and this tends to be uh, on the basis of their buying potential, their demographics, their educational level. It could be in, on the basis of their needs and demands, and sometimes when we look at um, segmenting, and the idea of segmentation is to understand the customer's behavior in terms of purchase. So technically speaking, there are four broad types of customer segmentations which are generally uh, you know, used in the industry and they tend to be demographic, which where we understand name, age, gender, education, income, family size, marital status, which is something which is very common. 
but there are other forms of segmentation that we look at, which is psychographic segmentation, there is geographic segmentation, and there is behavioral segmentation. Psychographic tends to be uh, related to things like your values, your culture, your belief, your lifestyle, and your personality straight. Geographic is, as the name and uh, you will understand, is geographic is where you come from, location, climate, you know, culture or language, or which population type you belong to in terms of density. So when I talk about cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Dubai, <coughs> Karachi, we talk about Islamabad, or we look at cities like Dhaka in the Indian subcontinent. Then we look at cities in Europe. Uh, if I look at you know, uh, London, for example, Milan, Paris, uh, these are cities which have high density in terms of population numbers. And sometimes when you look at geographic segmentation, you need to look at where best your campaign would make a dent or, you know, get you the best returns. And what you are looking at essentially doing is planning your media or your spend of the promotions in terms of media that you look at to reach as many number of users as possible. And that is where geographic segmentation comes in. We look at behavioral segmentation here segmentation would be looking at you know understanding the behavior of the customer and that would be looking at you know things like uh how do you purchase how often do you purchase are you loyal to a particular brand would you make decisions on the basis of discounts or offers if they are provided and this helps marketers essentially you know tailor further or fine-tune and tailor uh you know campaigns when they are running it for their uh you know customers so when we look at some of these terms, which you see in the, uh, you know, indicative content, we'll cover and, uh, you know, cover them. And obviously the idea would be to try and address and at least understand what is their meaning, what is their relevance and the context to digital and social media marketing. Now, in this learning outcome, we are going to be looking at, you know, primarily understanding the traditional seven P's of marketing, which is where this is called the marketing mix. And these seven P's essentially tend to be, you know, price, place, product, promotion, physical evidence, people, and packaging. We'll go to that in a bit more detail. We'll, we'll look at automated and non-automated sales support activities. So where do we use systems and automation to be able to get traditional repetitive processes automated? We look at what are the various digital communication platforms that we can use to enhance customer experience. Now, most companies are looking at using tools and techniques which basically help the customer do a couple of things. For example, with the lesser, lesser, the I would use the word with the lowest amount of clicks, they want you to be able to find a product. So, for example, you look at a website, and just a broad example here to address the assessment criteria, we'll go into details. But if you have a website wherein the customer has to do too many clicks to go to a product that they are searching, you start with bicycles, you start with, say, uh, bicycles, then you go into, you know, tricycles, bicycles, uh, you know, monocycles, things like that. And then you go into child, you know, cycles and, uh, you know, adult cycles. But what you are essentially doing is, although you are segmenting products on your website in a very clear, rational manner, but... This is adding to the number of clicks which the learner person or the browser would need to add to. And sometimes it becomes frustrating and what they will do is they switch off the browser and then you know open or go to a new site. So you have to optimize the experience which the customer uh, and, and set the expectation in the way wherein the customer is able to you know, look at uh, getting the information and also gets an experience of getting that information say quickly, promptly it could be in a concise in a uh, you know um, in a manner in which it is quite concise but also in a manner which allows him to compare a number of products and sometimes you would see sites have what are called comparisons built in and these are things that we will look at in terms of tools and platforms which companies can use to be able to streamline and you know kind of uh, create a very good customer experience sometimes you visit a website and you say wow what a website you know, I was able to get all the information. I got all the things that I wanted to. And it was so simple to browse the website. Sometimes you go to websites, like for example, Amazon, if you visit, Amazon has millions and millions of products listed. So sometimes when you do a search on batteries, if you want to buy, until you specify you want AAA batteries or AA batteries or you know button cells or things like that, it's very difficult. It'll throw up searches, which will run into 500 different types of searches. Then they create automation on the website by adding filters sort the products lowest to the highest price, highest to the lowest price, most popular product, product with most popular reviews, five-star reviews, 
products which are primarily having, you know, um, I say in stock. And these are things which are filters, which the website is applying. But what these filters are looking at doing is automating things by showing decreased number of results so that the customer is able to make a decision. And that is what we will look at in the third assessment criteria. Last one is it talks about analyze and evaluate e-commerce based on business models. Now, when we talk about business platforms, B2B, Amazon is a B2B, B2C, D2C uh, website. That means it sells directly to consumer. There are businesses on Amazon's website which are selling to other businesses. There are businesses which are selling to consumers as well. And then Amazon has its own branded products that it tries and sells because it has the muscle power to be able to you know, buy some of those in bulk uh, because of the quantity that it sells across the online store. And then it can offer those white label products to other uh, you know, companies which are listing or having stores on Amazon themselves. So here, it could be a variety of ways in which the e-commerce platform could generate revenue uh, for Amazon. It is not just Amazon selling to customers directly. Amazon's revenue comes from selling to businesses, its affiliates, uh, selling to you know consumers, and even selling to enterprise or corporate buyers because there are uh, people which uh, or companies and Amazon has or, or does promote you know a business account. And in those cases, it does provide customers uh, products, you know, on the business side as well. So this particular learning outcome that we're going to look at is going to be focused on understanding what are the approaches digital marketers need to take uh, in order to, you know, better understand and segment their customers to which they are going to be looking at selling products or services of the company. And when we talk about selling products and services of the company, they would be looking at picking the media which will be most optimum for the company to use in terms of budgeting and in terms of you know getting them the best possible results. Now, one of the other things that we also look at talking about is contemporary issues or challenges. Now, these are issues or challenges which marketers would face because they are looking at uh, obviously working with uh, you know um, let's say. Uh, certain platforms and tools, and these platforms and tools have, um, let's say, features uh, which will allow customers to take control of how the interaction, uh, you know, or how they interact with the website. So things like ad blocker, you know, you you in your Google Chrome browser or in most of the browsers, you generally see when you try and download multiple, uh, you know, uh, things from one website, it tends to block. <clears throat> you know, the the uh, downloading of simultaneous number of files uh, because it sees it or perceives it as, uh, you know, a virus attack. So things like when we talk about challenges, contemporary challenges in the case of digital marketing, if you think, or think, think of a few by putting on your creative ad would be that, you know, if you advertise in the newspaper and if you do an insert in a newspaper or a flyer, what will happen essentially is that uh, if the flyer company or the insert company does not insert all the flyers and you know charges you for it but you don't get response you would probably not know that you know this has not happened so that is a challenge that they could face that sometimes when they have to insert flyers in one newspaper again five also some of them do not get sometimes and you know what they do is quickly insert them at the time of distribution in the morning uh, you know from distribution centers so it is a challenge because sometimes this technique could not uh, lead to a good result because not every household might get a flyer, but some households might get multiple flyers because the insertion has happened in a way wherein a guy has picked up five and it's pushed it into the paper. So these are traditional challenges. But when we look at digital channels, what could be the challenges? Things like privacy concern in the in Europe, essentially, journal data protection regulation, you know, GDPR as we call it, has become quite important because companies who sell to customers in Europe cannot keep or store data of uh, you know European customers outside Europe on uh, uh, you know other servers so if Facebook uh, you know which is a US based company has 2 billion users and a good 330 million of them are in, in Europe then all that data has to be within the data centers within Europe it can't be stored in the US China India or any other place in the world it has to be within uh, within the European uh, reach um, so these are things that you will look at, which are called contemporary issues. Sometimes Google will block certain AdWords or the way you run promotions by changing algorithms. 
Uh, you would look at, for example, um, um, you know, things like, um, I would say, um, blocking, which could be uh, happening, unsubscription, uh, subscribing of emails that you can do, although you're subscribed to a newsletter, but if you get too many of them or the frequency is too high, you end up unsubscribing. So what happens is you have to give a consumer an option to say subscribe or have uh, have the option to unsubscribe. And in those cases, these, could, these options which are available in technology or because of technology can actually become challenges or contemporary issues for digital marketers. That is the essence of today's studying learning outcome three. Now, let me switch you over to the presentation and we'll discuss this in a bit more detail. So when we talk about learning outcome three, we are looking at recommending resource-led innovative approaches of how we can use digital media tools uh, and also overcome using these tools, contemporary challenges which we face when we are looking at digital media marketing. Now, there are four aspects of it. As I mentioned, the first one that we want to go into is just uh, have a brief understanding of what is marketing mix. So when you look at the term marketing mix, and, and if I describe, you know, what is marketing mix? Marketing mix is basically, you know, um, uh, I would put it this way, the fundamental business model, which, you know, when, when marketing as an outset field started, what we wanted to do was basically create a framework which would help us plan and execute, you know, some of the marketing activities or promotions that we do. And when we look at these, what um, Jerome, um, you know, did, um, who was the... Uh, American psychologist, which basically created the marketing mix, um, you know, what he did was he basically came up um, with the four P's at that point in time. And when we talk about these four P's, uh, we look at Jerome McCarthy, you know, who's the person who introduced this uh, way back in the 1950s. His work was based, he was an American marketing professor and obviously a psychologist, which, you know, came across with this idea that if we know what the customers want, at what place they want, at what price they want, then we can better plan our promotions, which would be basically messaging that can go across to the consumer, and that would yield good results for companies. So his first, uh, you know, experiments that he did, and when he developed this as a model, he published this in a book called Basic Marketing, a Managerial Approach. And he then uh, you know, when he published this book, he created these four elements of marketing, as we call it, uh, marketing mix. And these four elements came to be known as synonymous to what is called four P's, product, price, place, promotion. That means as a company or as an organization, as a business, you need to have a product. That product you will sell at a particular place. You would need to know the price and you would need to know how you would go about messaging or sending the promotion or messaging across to consumers to be able to attract them to buy the product. And this particular uh, uh, you know, concept is called the marketing mix. Now, this has, and over the years and decades, in the last uh, you know, few decades, has undergone tremendous change. It is now four P's of marketing have become seven P's of marketing, which is more widely accepted. And in these seven P's, when we talk about the seven P's of marketing, we are basically looking at including if I bring this across, just as a picture, so these seven P's typically tend to be, uh, you know, apart from price, promotion, place, and product, these four, these three were added on, which in the current decade and times is relevant because when we look at messaging, most of it is created by people. When we look at companies selling products and services, and there are some of these companies are multinational or global companies which have operations in different geographies, it is basically the processes that they are replicating to be able to sell and use the same processes in different places to be able to sell products to consumers. And physical evidence tends to be, you know, uh, something which uh, when we talk about the marketing mix and when we talk about physical evidence, what we are looking at in this case is primarily, you know, the um, ability that anything that the company offers is going to be. Uh, you know, something tangible. That means it is something physical as a product or even as a service and the customer 
is able to experience either the product or the service the product provides. And this can be then associated to visual and sensory aspects of the brand. That means you can feel the product. You can obviously get a feeling from the product. Like, for example, if you apply perfume, um, you know, obviously it is something that you apply to your clothes or to your skin, but you actually, your sensory, uh, you know, your nose, you're able to smell the freshness of it when you apply that. And that is basically related to, you know, uh, helping the marketers understand the physical attributes along with, you know, the sensory and visual aspects of it, which are connected to the brand. So if I say, um, you know, just as an example, if I say, um, that in the marketing mix, I'm looking at existing and potential customers. And what I want to see is how do I engage with the customers, um, you know, and how do the customers actually engage with us or the brand? Then in those cases, some part of it would be done using what is called the physical evidence. And in the physical evidence, you could basically see if a customer gets into a retail store, there is a particular layout of the store. Uh, in the layout of the store, there's a particular, uh, you know, way in which it is being colored or branded. And that is where, when we talk about the elements like packaging, how the product is packaged, uh, like you buy the Apple phone or the Galaxy phone, the packaging is, is for an expensive product of that value, you do see that the packaging makes genuine sense. Uh, you know, it has minimal amount of paperwork. The user manual is like a ready reference a leaflet um, and you know the packaging feels quite premium so when you touch the product you get that is what is physical evidence and you are interacting with the packaging which basically tells you that this is something which is specifically uh, you know designed to hold the product and it communicates some of the brand you know meanings and the elements uh, that the customer would want to see or feel when you buy such a product. So in some cases, when you look at physical evidence, it plays a very crucial role because it helps in shaping the customer's expectation. It helps in building trust and it also helps in influencing decisions our customers take in the long run. And these are some of the aspects of why physical evidence has been added as one of the important, uh, you know, piece to the marketing mix over the over the last few years. Now, the reason marketing mix is important is because whether we look at traditional mode of marketing or digital mode of marketing, marketing mix plays in on both aspects of it. Because unless we know who the customer is, what product they like, what price at which they would want to buy, and where they would want to buy from. If we don't know these things, then essentially company would be firing in the dark or, you know, mud slinging on the wall because they don't know who their customer is or they don't understand what uh, customers is it, it is attracting for its products and services. So marketing mix tends to be the basic or the very fundamental of where marketers actually look at making a start and they look at identifying uh, after identifying the product the play, uh, you know, the product and the price, they would then go into something like, uh, you know, play, uh, place and promotions and where they would be selling those uh, to the consumer, how they would be selling those. And that is where these, um, you know, uh, considerations have to be looked at from a point of view of market planning. And, and from a point of view, of, when I say market planning, planning for promotions, planning for advertising, planning for any sort of above the line, below the line promotion, so that the company's dollar or the budget being used to, you know, attract consumers and send this messaging across is able to yield results. That means you're, the company is able to realize revenue, is able to book revenue, and that is what the importance of, you know, marketing mix would be. Now, there is a good handout that you can read, which will familiarize you with the marketing mix, how it started, what it does, and how is it related to planning and segmentation, and why marketers use it, and how it is over the years expanded to seven pieces of marketing and even nine pieces of marketing. So when we look at um, product, each of the aspects of product have to be considered uh, while you know looking at uh, you know, coming up with something new, which the company is going to position for the customer. So when we talk about a product, they will look at things like design, the quality, the features of the product. They'll talk about what are the optional, uh, you know, options that customers can actually add to that product. And 
how will the packaging of the product will be and then what kind of positioning will it have in the market are there similar products in the market from other competitors are uh, is the product going to be unique or in terms of the product whether it's going to be priced premium or is it going to be you know mainstream or is it going to be something which is uh, uh, you know going to be introduced uh, from a point of view of uh, let's say helping the company regain market share. So positioning of the product is going to be very important. And these are the parameters that you normally consider when we talk about the marketing mix. Now, with that broad understanding, what we want to be able to do is analyze this by taking an example of what is traditional marketing mix. So when we talk about these seven Ps, we are referring to uh, you know product price, place, promotion, people, processes, and physical evidence. And what I would want you to do here would be to pick a product of your choice and then look at defining the marketing mix for that product by individually taking into account price, place, product, promotion, physical evidence, people and, and, and processes. So if I say, if I look at, and just for example, if I look at, say, for example, um, let's put it this way, take up an example of uh, perfume. Now, if we stick to this product as, uh, you know, perfume, and I want to analyze the seven Ps, what I would start with first is look at the product itself, the perfume bottle, how it is designed. Is it, you know, round? Is it square? Is it got a different signature design? What color is, uh, what is the exterior color of the bottle? What is the capacity? Does it hold 50 CL, 75 CL, or you know, is it a 100 ml kind of a bottle of perfume? We will get into every aspect of product design, um, you know, some of the features of the product. Then we'll also look at how it is packaged. You know, is it in a what kind of packaging does it come in? Is it does, is it in a hard cardboard packing? Is it in a soft cardboard packing? Does the packaging have any sort of branding on it? How well packed is it internally to protect the uh, product bottle itself? How fancy is the bottle? All these attributes of the product will be considered when we discuss, uh, you know, P for product specifically under a marketing mix, because these specifics would then be required by uh, marketers to put into, uh, when I say put into, I mean, what I mean by that is, that they'll be looking at creating USPs or unique selling propositions. And these unique selling propositions would help them define messaging, which they send to consumers, help them differentiate against what the competitive offering is, and then talk about some of the benefits of how it differs as a product from, uh, from the competitors and why, if they're charging premium for it, or there's a higher price to what is actually available in the market, then why are they charging a higher price? Why is it premium? Because, and that would need to be explained and all that would be covered under, you know, product. Now, similarly, we will look at some of the attributes that we talk about price, uh, which the second P would, uh, you know, kind of bring in. So here, the kind of questions that you will be offering is, will there be a higher end offering at an additional cost? So when you buy, say, for example, uh, assuming you're going to buy a, a car, now, what you would do is you go to the dealership, you like a particular model, and then the dealer would ask you what all features would you want in the model. So, for example, things like air conditioning, you want radial tires, you want, you know, alloy wheels, you want maybe padding, a bit more padding uh, in the carpet, you want the floor mats, you want a clock in the car, you want maybe the option of cigarette lighters in all the four places where passengers sit. You want a mid rest compartment. You want maybe beige color seat covers. You want it in, you know, cow skin or things like that. So all these are things that you're exploring in terms of the attributes of the product, but they all have a price tag associated to it because it's not standard. So if you want a diesel option or a petrol option, do you want a, a you know, say a smaller engine option or a larger engine option. These are all features which, which will be considered basis the price. And this is what you're expected to make a decision on by asking these questions, thereby helping you 
purchase a particular model of the car. So pricing is going to be important because sometimes if the products are not selling, manufacturers would offer sales promotions or some sort of discounts on it. There would be, you know, aspects of quality, which is why this you prefer to buy, say, a particular product over the other. And then in some cases, you will perceive that the value of the brand is more, much more than the price that you're paying. And that is why you would choose that price and product over something else. Like sometimes people would prefer to buy a Mercedes. The reason is they are loyal to the brand. They know that the performance of the car is much better. They sometimes feel that they having driven Mercedes earlier. They feel that this is a company wherein you know customers are cared for, cared for. And in terms, if you're paying a slightly higher price, you will still go with the premium when you end up buying the product because it, you know that this product delivers you know, for, uh, the benefits that the um, price is actually highlighting or talking about. So the planning of any promotions that generally is done, uh, you know, is taking into account uh, you know, um, is taking into account the marketing mix. And that is why it becomes the heart of the marketing plan that you create. Now, whether you're doing it for traditional marketing, which is news, print, uh, you know, or media, or whether you're doing it for online marketing, it will become the heart of your marketing plan because this is where it will ask you to consider the various aspects of uh, the uh, promotion and they would be related to product, place, price, promotion, process, physical evidence, and people. Now, <coughs> you could prioritize which particular uh, P comes, you know, takes priority when you're planning, you know, the uh, implementation of this marketing uh, promotion. And that could be that in some cases, you might give precedence to, uh, say, um, you know, price of the product or positioning of the product because you want to see and reach a particular type of audience. And that is where, uh, you know, the option available will be. Hello. For some of these, you know, pricing products on that side. Yeah, Nisha. Any questions, Nisha? Hi, Nisha, I wish that you're in. Okay. Now, when we talk about, uh, you know, online marketing mix, what we are looking at essentially doing is, any questions that you are in, feel free to ask. Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So when you look at, um, you know, things which are related to the online marketing mix, one of the benefits that you would get to see is that we are able to create and, you know, plan some of these things even before we are able to put this into practice. As against the traditional marketing media, what tends to happen is you do the promotion and you see the outcome of it, or oh, that's not given us the response that we expected. But you can actually pilot and test out some of the online uh, side of things because there is an option available within softwares and obviously with the use of technology, these things can be trialed out before carrying out a full-blown marketing promotion. And you are able to tweak the requirements as you go along of your, uh, you know, marketing mix, depending on what kind of response you're getting from the uh, promotion that you're carrying out for a product. Now, when we, and I, I would want to give this as an example, say in this case, when we talk about the digital marketing mix, there are advantages over the traditional media. One is as I mentioned, the last one that you can tweak your campaigns, extend the budget or extend your campaigns by a number of days or uh, for, a, for a period of time because you see great response coming in or, you know, in certain areas you might want to redirect your budget and maybe put more focus on certain areas because you see more response coming from certain area as against the uh, way in which you initially planned these promotions. So these are advantages that you generally get to see uh, businesses can get, uh, you know, from when they are actually using, uh, you know, online, um, uh, you know, basically marketing mix when they are implementing it for online promotions. So a combination of factors that can be controlled by the company to influence consumers and in the purchase of product. And to a certain extent, these factors making, uh, you know, or providing the capability 
to influence the buyer's uh, decision is the reason why you know online marketing mix is going to be much more easier and beneficial for the organization to plan as against the traditional uh, side of things because in those cases when you give a creative sign off or when you give it to the agency to roll out the promotion there is no stopping it there is no rolling it back because obviously everything is planned put into the system creatives are already made and you know it is being released as an advert on a particular day across uh, you know many cities or geographies but on digital side you are able to change the creative you're able to basically adjust the uh, campaign timing. You are able to uh, redirect some of, some of the creatives or by changing it, replacing it altogether. And that is all benefits of what is uh, when we use, you know, the online uh, marketing mix, um, the use of marketing mix specifically for online promotions. And this is what I've explained when you talk about, you know, the marketing mix. So I've probably put two, three slides on for explaining all of the, uh, you know, P's that we want to look at. And then the example that I've looked at, uh, you know, for the digital marketing strategy, when you look at planning it using the seven P's of marketing, how you would basically plan out everything on paper before you start implementing it. You can test it out as a pilot in one or two locations. You can readjust the creatives. You can readjust or redefine your audience and you can start and stop the promotion because all these are, you know, electronically, uh, there are controls available wherein I could start a Facebook promotion. Uh, initially, I planned it for three weeks, but if I've started to get too many inquiries, I would want to pause the promotion two weeks into the promotion. I can do that, but it will not be possible when you do it for print or, uh, you know, TV advertising because budgets, times, and schedules are already committed and there is no way to stop that until unless, you know, uh, um, until unless, you know, you basically uh, stop the campaign uh, altogether uh, without replacing it. So these are things that you'll have to keep into mind and the considerations why uh, companies would look at now choosing online as against traditional uh, media for the purposes of advertisement promotions would be that this allows them to take advantage of, uh, you know, various other platforms like the website, social media, and the same promotion can also be put across on those mediums, which allows them to reach more customers and obviously uh, looks at, you know, creating a bit of a marketing blitz, which allows it to reach its desired goals when it is putting budget and investment behind uh, promotions uh, to you know sell its products and services now a typical uh, marketing strategy if i look at you know um, uh, if i say um i put it this way if i have to say um you know give me an example of say a typical digital marketing strategy now, you know, how would you go about, uh, you know, um, say, creating a digital marketing strategy? So here, if I were to ask you this open-ended question, what you are looking at doing is to come up with this particular strategy of how you would go about selling a product. First is identify a product. So, for example, let's look at, uh, you know, um, a digital marketing strategy for, um, if I have to give an example, um, I, I think to my mind, uh, you know, coming is say dove soap, for example. Um, if I look at, um, you know, soap and within soap, I'm looking at say dove soap. Now, if I look at this as a, as a, as if I was the marketing manager and my, my responsibility is to basically create a marketing strategy for dove soap uh, and that to a digital marketing strategy, I will go about doing some of these things. So first of all, what I would do is, basically look at ident identifying the target audience. Who are the audience which utilize or buy this soap? Now, this soap, as you know, is slightly higher in price as compared to some of the other soaps that we can buy. It is a soap which basically advertises and distinguishes itself from other brands by saying that it has more, uh, you know, uh, let's say it promotes self-beauty in a, in, in a sense, and it has more, cream or you know it moisturizes your skin much better than any other soap so it has less contents of glycerin and things like that technically i'm aware of the soap content and that's why i'm getting into a bit of detail but here the main part is you're defining the target audience 
and ensuring that you know exactly who you are, are going to target the promotions for. So in most cases, Dove Soaps, you know, predominantly promotion is done for women. It is, uh, you know, um, a sold as an aspir as a product which basically helps enhance beauty. And in some cases, you know, you would also be looking at highlighting advantages of the uh, mix or the product mix uh, of the soap, which will help, uh, you know, appeal to the buyer for decision making. The second thing that you're going to be looking at doing for the digital strategy would be to look at a bit of emotional branding. How would you attach the message and relate it to the emotional side of things with the buyer when they are looking at making a purchase decision? So here the aim of this uh, advert or the campaign would be essentially to look at highlighting that how can you indulge yourself uh, into uh, being a selfless beauty, for example, by using Dove Soap. Then you can also talk about uh, a campaign or some sort of a promotion that could be done, uh, which would allow people to come in and experience the product, touch and feel the product, and they would be used as brand ambassadors or, you know, as people who would be, uh, you know, whose opinions and thought processes will be taken into account and then shared um, in, 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 in certain types of promotions to sell the product. So what I'm trying to say here is, you could get a celebrity to endorse the product in short. And that would mean that if you can relate to that celebrity and it is something which uh, you can relate to or you like, you would be tempted uh, easily to be able to buy that product. Then Dub would need to highlight what is called the differentiation. What kind of product differentiation does the soap have? So soap is a category, but Dub would need to emphasize on the benefits of moisturizing, uh, you know, gentle cleansing, and, you know, maybe create certain other aspects or talk about certain other aspects which are different from other soaps uh, in the industry. They could also look at, uh, you know, social media um, enablement, which would mean that at some stage, um, the company would be looking at advertising, sending messages across about the soap, it's, and the benefit it has, how it is better than competition, or some of the branding side of things to do promotions uh, by offering, you know, freebies to customers, that is where, you know, they would be looking at uh, engaging with social media. And then sometimes you would also see that influencers are able to help. So influencer marketing as a content, you know, when, when we look at people who are able to, um, who have a following already on the on online channels, and they are able to endorse your product, to say that if you buy this product, then you know this is the best product or the best part of the soap category product that you can buy from the market for your skin. And influencer marketing might also be quite useful. And this is just maybe the tip of the iceberg in terms of how would I give you an example of a typical marketing strategy which is designed, you know, for Dove soaps in particular. And this is how you would probably go about, you know, discussing how a strategy. Uh, online or a digital media strategy has to be created for promotion of a particular product online. So any questions on this? Um, no, no, thank you. Let's look at uh, a second criteria, which talks about different automated and non-automated, you know, um, activities that can be performed to basically help marketing through digital media. Now, here, what we are looking at is essentially talking about key concept of automation. And when we look at uh, marketing in particular, what we are looking at is uh, basically sales automation, which is going to be help uh, softwares or processes, which are going to help us in completing repetitive tasks, tasks which have to be done ta time and again. And these tasks, when done time and again, would essentially be looking at completing some of the, uh, you know, activities that we need to do to be able to promote a brand or promote the product. Now, when we talk about automation and we talk about automation activities, for example, we do emailing, right? Now, one simple example of automation applied to emails tends to be, say, for example, if I'm going on a holiday tomorrow, what I would do is go into my email client, choose autoresponder, and if I'm away from tomorrow till Monday, what I would do is basically put in a message, and then that would basically be. Uh, saved 
and I will switch it on starting 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, and then I'll switch it off, uh, you know, Monday morning at 10 a.m. or 9 a.m. Now, what this automation would do is, if any email comes to me during this time frame that I'm away, it will send an automatic reply I to. I can't hear you. Hello. One second. Yeah. So, just keep. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi. So, in this case, one form of automation would be that you will have an email responder which will particularly automate your process. For example, if I'm going on leave, you put an automation to say uh, that any email which comes should automatically respond to that email to say, I'm, uh, I'm currently away from uh, my desk on a holiday or I'm currently away on holiday for a couple of days and I'll be picking up your emails, uh, you know, starting on such, such day. Now, anybody who sends an email would automatically get that response and the email will still go into your inbox and that is a very simple form of automation that can be applied when you're going out on a holiday or when you're away from your desk. Similar set of activities which can be applied on a mass or a bigger scale to send out details across or you know promotional activities or alerts across to thousands and millions of customers would essentially be covered under what is called sales automation. So here automation would look at certain types of tasks if you, another form of automation typically tends to be when you go onto a website and you are there on the home page and you browse a certain pages, number of pages, you've spent a bit of time. What will happen is if the website has CRM system integrated into it, it will show me the customer journey that you have performed on our website. Where did you come in? Which pages did you browse? What pages did you click on? And, you know, finally, where did you exit the website and how much time did you spend on it? Now, if there were automation defined in the background, what would have happened is if you went from one course to the other and you were interested in reading about the course, you spent over a minute. And I had defined this in the automation that a customer stays and uh, stays on the home page or then clicks after a couple of minutes going to another page to looking at, uh, you know, whether the qualification is being completed or not. Uh, or in this case, you are looking at finding out, downloading a brochure, then some part of this could be automated. That means if you don't download a brochure and you're on the website, what will happen is after you shut down the website, we come out of it a couple of minutes down the line, you will receive an automatic email to say, were you interested in this course? Get a 10% off if you buy the course today. Now, these are things which the website and the CRM system in the background are collecting. And what they're trying to do is start an engagement or a interaction with you to try and get you back to the website where you can come in and then buy a course which you would be later interested in studying as a student. And these are bits that would be, you know, important because if I had to do this and sit and put 10 people on it because there are thousands of customers browsing the website, it won't be possible. And that is where you would need automation to be implemented so that if anybody clicks on it, or anybody browsing a page, uh, you know, there might be thousands of customers browsing the home page at any given point in time. But if they click through from the home page to a course page, then an automation kicks in and that would send them some sort of a pop up or a discount coupon or an automatic email saying thank you for visiting UKVersity's website. And these kind of things that are done primarily to support the sales activities would be termed as automation. Now, there are different benefits of automation, lots of different types of benefits for automation. One of the benefits of automation would be that you'll be able to decide and filter on whether these are customers who are interested or are just simply browsers to your website. Just as an example, I've taken website right now. Then you'd be able to collect information about your customers because it's digital cookies that normally are stored on the machine will be able to get you some information in terms of their location, time of browsing, look at you know, bits and pieces of information which would be available on your browser, things like your name, uh, maybe where your gender. And these are things which sometimes cookies can pick up when you are browsing websites. And they would allow the marketers to gain insight into, uh, you know, information related to your personal or demographic aspects. Now, some of these automations could be helpful for you because it will help in creation of documents like 
case histories or customer journeys, and they would then, you know, be useful at a later stage when you know that this customer is looking at buying a particular product or is looking at, you know, essentially using it, um, you know, or buying it and then going to be using it at a later stage to, say, complete some part of their studies. Now, follow-ups can be automated. And generally speaking, if you haven't had a customer come back to your site for the last three days, but they visited on Monday, for example, and then they've gone back on Thursday, and if they haven't returned, then you can use that uh, as a bit of a follow-up process. And this also will be a part and parcel of what is called automation. Now, there are lots of other benefits of automation, things like call analysis, creation of proposals, depending on what all you're going to be looking at covering from a point of view of uh, understanding, uh, you know, the requirements of the customer. And these requirements could tend to be, you know, sometimes you see when you leave the website, you get an automatic email giving you the details of that course with a bit of a discount code and saying that, you know, this offer is valid for 10, 10 days uh, from the date of today. And that would help you entice customers or bring in more revenue or maybe get more customers to sign up for your products and services. Now, what all can be automated using CRM systems today, customer relationship management systems like Salesforce, Zoho CRM, HubSpot, customers have started to implement the versions of these on their website. So what you are able to see essentially is uh, these particular, uh, you know, web, say for example, a particular website should be able to then automate the process of what is called lead distribution. And lead distribution could be, if there are a number of customers on the site, and assuming your site is chat enabled and customers have questions and if there are 20 browsers on the home page and uh, somebody starts or wants to ask a question you can have one simple way wherein it could create a chat flow and individually each of the managers or you know people involved in sales can be then aligned by sending a message to them saying that you know whenever they sign on to the website and a different agent gets automated uh, associated this would allow multiple customers to be served at any given point in time. And this allocation of inquiries can be done through the CRM software, and that is what helps in lead generation or distribution. Now, prioritization of leads can be done, which is to say which lead you know is more keen on buying the product is at a stage wherein they are able to uh, just about making a decision. And those are parameters that you would be seeing that your CRM system would be able to prioritize on, and this will be lead prioritization. That means, you know, you are saying, okay, I'll start the course tomorrow. Somebody saying, I'll start the course on Friday. What you are going to do in your funnel is prioritize which learner is going to be starting today and which is going to be starting Wednesday, but you proactively are able to do this through a process of auto sales automation using a CRM software. Now, there are alerts, pop-ups, checkouts, uh, you know, discounts, which can be uh, enabled on the system. And these would generally be coming across from sales alerts. There would be automatic reporting, which is generating any sort of sales activity, which the consumer is actually doing on the website. And that is all being recorded under the uh, automation side of things, wherein this would be later used on for the purposes of reporting. And all this, if you want to see visually, you can try and see that automation typically would be quite helpful when we look at, uh, you know, having, uh, let's say, a broad uh, participation of, I would say, or all your colleagues, or in some cases, you know, um, an option wherein, uh, you know, some part of the, um, uh, you know, activities that have to be performed can be done uh, under this particular umbrella. So you have CRM system available. That mm -hmm. system can, you know, allow you to reach consumers, but it also helps you capture data about consumers. And one such option that you see of the system mentioned here is only channel. If you go on to a website, you know, our website, we've integrated a chatbot. So if you want information on certain things, you can ask the chatbot and it will basically go through the pages of the website and then respond to your questions in the best possible manner. And these would tend to be, you know, the ways through which you would look at automation on, uh, you know, the platforms. And this automation will deliver maybe some efficiencies in terms of storage, 
and in some cases you would also be looking at um you know the benefits of uh, i would say um the benefits of you know uh, engagement and retention with the customer because the automation side of things is enabling these interactions to happen in when the customers are happy getting responses but at the same time you are happy getting the data about the customer and not every call as they say produces a customer that would mean that you would probably have the option to retweak adjust your communication to finally looking at uh, you know sending it out where it makes or has the right amount of impact now <clears throat> the next assessment criteria just very briefly is about various forms of various platforms of digital communication now various forms of digital communication here we look at social media we look at websites we look at in person obviously when you are uh, doing interaction through a call call center or a contact center and sometimes you know it is being done through the mobile phone now these are various forms of interactions that you can do with customers using different mediums so when i say social media we're looking at facebook twitter linkedin you know um, instagram and they are basically social media channels through which you can engage with customer when i talk about web i'm predominantly referring to the website when i talk about in person that means you've made a visit to the office or you're meeting the person in person uh, at a particular outlet or in a trade show or a, a, at a stall in a big show things like that and then when we talk about contact center it will be predominantly call centers and when i look at website of the company then in that case that will be related to um, you know the mobile side of things wherein mobile text messaging or uh, you know mobile tracking or sending in of updates on the mobile is being done to interact with the customer now why do we need to select digital tools uh, in particular for interacting with uh, digital digitally with our customers there are various reasons of doing it now one obviously is you would need to get you, the reason why you're doing it is you want immediate response you know you want uh let's say to find out whether this campaign has had an effect or not and you would want an immediate response and in this case basically you would set up a mechanism through which either you will call the customer to find out or the customers would essentially interact with a particular software where the software will then pick up uh you know uh, have questions and once those questions are answered uh, it will basically bring out some sort of analysis which will help you understand how the campaign has actually run now there are certain tools which can help you get hold of this data and these tools tend to be customer relationship management and free tools um and some of these free tools could be tools like help desk for example if you have a problem you can reach the help desk through the website ask them a question through the chat route and then help resolve the problem but what the companies are looking at doing today is basically employing what is called as crm software customer relationship management software this particular uh, software or crm would allow automation of all the activities need need to be done for the customer and you would be in control of a dashboard so things like sending out emails messages receiving emails auto reply of emails sending out promotional codes you know including newsletters they would all be a part and parcel of you know what would the crm system actually entail and then within the crm system you have these tools emails you have a call center software you can record the calls you can you know speak to customers uh, they would be integrated as a part of it and then at some stage you'll also look at analytics this is google analytics or any sort of other a call metrics as an analytics which will be used by marketers to understand the journey of the customer uh, as far as their product is concerned or when they bought the product is concerned then the availability of chatbots this is something that i want to uh, you know you can experience on our website if you go on to our website you would probably see that there is a chatbot that we have created uh, and this chatbot basically allows you to get answers to certain questions uh, you know um say for example if you want to do the search on the website but aren't you know uh, are feeling a bit lazy and you don't want to be looking at uh, you know browsing so many pages what you would basically do is go on to our website and using this chatbot 
uh, you know, basically um, uh, ask that question. And that question essentially would then be answered by uh, the chatbot and that chatbot would provide, uh, you know, some answers to you. So as you can see, in this case, I've asked, uh, you know, there is a query that I placed, uh, you know, diploma, I've written diploma in strategy marketing, and it has basically gone across and given me some search options uh, by looking and reading the website. And this is automation in action. So it has given me some basic things like the diploma is available, the fees is 1500. If there's anything that you want to look at about the diploma, you can ask a question like when, uh, or say for example, how can I enroll into this course? So if I write this and press enter, the chatbot, the way it's been configured, it'll tell you that what you need to do is fill up an enrollment form. And once the enrollment form is complete, uh, you know, the uh, company will come back to you with an offer letter, provide the course material and things like that. So this is an example of how companies are using automation now on certain, uh, you know, platforms like website, when in this bit of information which the customer is seeking uh, can be actually provided through the use of chatbots on the uh, on the websites. Now, if I go into uh, you know a couple of others, um, there are lots and lots of different automations which are possible analytics which can be done, and they are all possible using the CRM software. So we will look at some examples and a case study which I'll uh, make available on Moodle that you can read through, and they will get into a bit more detail of how you are looking at evaluating uh, or looking at digital communication the tools which are available and the platforms that can be used to enhance you know customer experience now any questions on this so far no i'm good thank you okay the last assessment criteria talks about analyzing and evaluating e-commerce based business model for revenue generation so here when we talk about um, you know certain aspects so when we look at the assessment criteria it talks about e-commerce based you know business models so when i say e-commerce based business models what do i mean you know what do i mean by that so when i say e-commerce based business models what we are basically talking about here is uh, the aspect of understanding how electronically commerce that means business can be conducted on sites platforms which are all digital that means they are all on the virtual uh, you know space now here, these platforms will be websites, aggregation portals, portals which are primarily uh, you know, sites which can aggregate and bring information across from a lot of different sites and make that available in a filtered, concise manner to the customer. And when we talk about some of these common uh, you know, uh, automation platforms, one of the key things that we talk about is, uh, you know, agglomeration in marketing. Now, when we talk about agglomeration in marketing, what we basically mean by that is that this particular is this term agglomeration is an economic term, essentially. And this is basically to uh, use when what we're trying to do is when businesses are trying to address uh, a cluster of customers, for example, they're trying to, uh, you know, I, I give this as an example that Suppose, say, for example, a company has its corporate headquarters and it also then has regional offices in a lot of different cities where it will then use those offices to, uh, you know, transact business. So when I say, uh, you know, agglomeration, what we are basically looking at is carrying out a process or a company carrying out a process which is going to concentrate on an economic activity in one place, but at the same time, it is going to be looking at uh, you know, using that activity to sell business products and services in a lot many different locations. And this is something which your website does when you advertise products on different portals or different websites. What you're trying to do is you're going to try and put your, uh, you know, products and services to work. And you don't know which site the customer would come across and rise for your product or service. Now, that is where sometimes you would see that brands have their own websites from which they can sell, but they also feel the urge and need to actually list their products 
or their products on a store within Amazon, within eBay, within some of the other major aggregation platforms because customers typically would maybe come to those platforms and buy because they feel more safe and secure. They feel my details are handled. I'll put it this way. They would feel that their details are handled in a much more professional manner and they are much more safe as compared to maybe having an interaction by leaving your details of the card or, you know, your transaction details on a, on a, on a smaller business website. So sometimes you would see that this is something which would be, you know, common, uh, commonly done by uh, companies when they are selling products to, you know, the customers to different, uh, you know, online portals or sites. Now, one of the other things that you would want to look at is because we are talking about different e-commerce models, which will allow revenue generation. There is one such model that we need to be aware of, which is called P2P or peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, peer-to-peer -peer business model is primarily used when we are looking at uh, shared ownership, uh, you know, of an asset. Now, a good example of this that I would say would be, you know, um, an example of uh, I would say. Uh, you know, Napster music, you know, if some of you remember Napster, uh, when it was invented as a service, what it allowed uh, users to do on Napster was to share the music, uh, you know, or the contents of uh, music albums or videos across uh, using peer-to-peer -peer networks. So, so what it meant was it, it was up, up, I had a collection of music on my PC, then if I was a part of Napster and I wanted to connect with somebody, uh, who was also using Napster as a part of that network and wanted to download a particular music or a tone that did not have, Napster allowed that sharing to happen using the peer-to-peer -peer network technology. So obviously at some stage, you know, this became illegal and obviously Napster got shut down. But as one of the platforms today and technologies available today, it is still used in the market to be able to drive revenue, uh, you know, or drive business. So what will happen is you would see competitors' product being placed together under a particular platform. So if I go to a retail store and I don't want to go to a branch store, but I want to go to a retail store wherein I can see all the brands in one store, uh, one roof, then in that case you would generally see this model uh, being, uh, you know, put into practice. Another example that I would give you is, um, you know, for peer-to-peer uh, -peer network would be, uh, or peer-to-peer -peer model would be Uber. Now, Uber as a car uh, riding service or as a service basically provides, uh, you know, uh, ride sharing. That means you can order an Uber, you can get a cab, and but you can also have uh, sharing of that particular cab in order to distribute or, you know, divide the expenses. And here, customers are looking at going to maybe similar destinations, and that is where this sharing part of the thing actually works. So when you look at Airbnb, Uber, for example, these are you know, platforms wherein you would generally see this kind of a model, you know, coming across. Now, when we talk about revenue models, there are lots of different types of revenue models, which essentially can be made to work on the e-commerce platform. These models typically tend to be, uh, you know, sales-based revenue model, advertising-based revenue models. So sales-based revenue model would be, if you list your, uh, or if you sell your product through a particular store, the store uh, would basically buy your inventory, but they will make a cut on it in the sense because they are selling the product for you in on your behalf through their outlet. They're going to charge an X amount of margin to be able to for from you to be able to place that product or basically have the opportunity to sell that product from their store. So this would be a case of revenue sharing, which would generally be in the case of selling products which or services which are basically, uh, you know, available to the buyer directly. Then you have advertising revenue model. This is something that we've heard about. Google creates a lot of revenue through advertising revenue model. When I go onto a website, I see sponsored links, I see AdWords, and that is where if there are keywords which are being searched by the customer, there are keywords that for which companies are paying for. And obviously Google is making money out of advertising because it will bring that search result on the top of the page as sponsored. And underneath that, you'll have the organic search, which is coming up, uh, you know, from the internet, uh, from the search engine. So in this case, 
advertising is being used to drive revenue for the company and that is why you'd probably term this as an advertising model then you have a revenue subscription based model subscription based model simple you have applications today that you buy on your iWatch or your Galaxy uh, watch and there are lots of applications some of these applications are available to you free to download some of them have a one time cost some of them have a subscription cost i'll give you a simple example of an application that i downloaded a couple of weeks back and that application was basically a fitness monitor now the fitness monitor basically gives you access to things like healthcare plan how do you plan your meals you know it can help you do a bit of diet planning keep a track of how much you're walking stepping running jogging cycling whatever the activities you're doing and you define that but this particular app has a subscription so these things are available to you either for a pay as you go or they're available to you for a year two year three years and it helps you monitor and obviously minimize your weight because at the end of the day the app is going to give you some uh, instructions you have to follow those instructions and if you keep following them religiously what that will be able to do is reduce help you reduce weight if that was the reason of buying that app now that is a subscription based model some of the features are available as free some of the features are only available if you subscribe to the app for a period of one month pay as you go three months six months and a year so obviously if i buy it for a year the subscription you know i will get it slightly cheaper and that's the way they price it 59.99 as against if i pay monthly it's 8.99 which is going to cost me 120 pounds for the year so subscription based models typically tend to be uh, models also used for driving revenue so netflix spotify dropbox are subscription based models if you cancel your subscription you know the benefits go away then we have transaction fee revenue model this particular model is the model wherein you best see this working with companies like pioneer paypal and when you buy uh, and transact using their uh, you know platform they charge a part of uh, a fraction of that fees that you're paying to the seller and they charge it because they are providing credit or credit checks in the background they are providing a plethora of services in the background and for which they will take their cut and that is where they will take a bit of transaction fee uh you know and that is why it is called the transaction fee revenue model then we look at affiliate models you are advertising products of different companies on your site and there's a link if somebody clicks on it and ends up buying their product you get a bit of a revenue out of it because you are working on what is called affiliate marketing that means you are trying to help promote products and services of different people or companies or customers and in this case if the product gets sold might not be on your website but on, on the customer's website but because they've got rerouted through you uh, or they've got redirected to you from the website you are going to be getting what is called an affiliate cut or some sort of a cut off the subscription you have other models which is like a freemium model this particular model is uh, used you know primarily by um, i would say um, you know this is primarily used by i would say companies which would want to gain you know um i'll put it this way um they want to gain for example increase their base for example they want to give you access to the usage of an app or they want to give you access uh, to the usage of say for example uh, popularize their product and what they would do is they'll give you some free offering that means they will make the basic features of the product available to you free but as you get more uh, you uh, as you start using it more often what they will also do is send you offers to be able to upgrade that free service to a premium service and that is where they will try and gain new customers and try and gain more revenue from you as a customer so some part of the service is free to get you used to using it and once you get hooked on then they are going to convert you into a paying customer and that is where freemium as a concept uh, generally comes in so these are some of the revenue based models that you would generally get to see uh, which are being employed by different companies to reach out to customers and use e-commerce as a op, uh, as a platform to be able to gain or you know generate revenues now a simple point in example that i'll give you is when you saw the iphone came out in 2007 the iphone then introduced what is called the i store or the i uh, you know apple store in 2009 and what they did was they started listing a lot of apps encouraged a lot of developers to create these apps so most of these apps in 2009 and 10 were free 
But as the traction, as the customer started to download more applications, became more familiar with the use of the phone, some of these apps started to, you know, start what are called subscription-based, uh, you know, um, pricing or features within their models. So you were using the free version of it, but at some stage, you know, like an office, uh, you know, application, uh, they gave you the basic feature of the office. That means you could open up documents on your phone and things like that. But when you wanted to edit it, you had to buy the app. So that was a strategy which was put into place to start creating revenue, uh, you know, through the app store. And then later on, Apple implemented 70-30 revenue model, wherein 70% of the revenue generated through the app store goes to the developer. 30% is what Apple maintains and retains because it maintains the ecosystem, updates it, and you know uh, provides the basic layout which is required for it to run seamlessly and provide a user experience. So you would see if you pick up a good example, you'll be able to basically look at uh, you know analyzing uh, this particular assessment criteria and then evaluating it by taking a good example and cover some of the revenue models which are used now by organizations to um, you know, generate revenue or increase turnover or get additional sales, whichever way you say it, through the route of what is called electronic commerce or e-commerce. Is that okay? Any questions on this uh, session today so far? No, I think it was a good session. I understood it pretty well. Good stuff. So what I will do is, Nisha, I will drop you an email uh, a couple of minutes later after the session to send or share with you a few case studies, which will also be available upon Moodle, and they will help you understand learning outcome one, two, and three. So if you go through them slightly, it will be easier for you to understand some part of the concepts that I've explained in slides by taking up examples and seeing how they are put into action. Okay. I also want to ask one thing. What yes. uh, is our assignment based on? I mean, for like, like this course, what will I, we be getting an assignment on? So basically, can I see that now? yes, yes, you can definitely see that. So in this particular unit and in this course, what will happen is you will have one assignment, which is something that you are going to be attempting towards the end of the completion of this unit. And that assignment is going to be asking you to, uh, you know, carry out or do certain activities. These activities will essentially mean that you will compile a Word document and that Word document essentially would then be submitted to us for the purposes of marking. So I'll quickly show this to you on Moodle. The assignment brief is already there. So when you log into Moodle and you go on to the specialist courses and click on strategic marketing, you would go down then to the unit, which is uh, digital and social media marketing, the last unit. And in this unit, you see this particular second document on the top, uh, which says AB, assignment brief, ending in AB, assignment brief. So when I click on this, what you're going to be able to see is uh, the grid that I'm using primarily for doing the teaching. So we have covered three learning outcomes today, up until now. And then at the fourth learning outcome, and after that, we'll do a discussion on the assignment. It gives you a bit of a scenario. And then it has two tasks in the assignment. Task one is a presentation that you will prepare covering some of these uh, bullet points which have been given. And then task two is going to be creating a digital marketing strategy or a campaign report. And that will have three sections in it. And these are the tasks which will be covered uh, when you look at, uh, you know, addressing and completing that assignment. There is a bit of a word limit given. So when you create a PowerPoint presentation, you're looking at about 10, 12 slides about 500 words as speaker notes. And then in the second task, it is about a 4,000 uh, words report, which will be, uh, you know, needing required to be produced covering sections A, B, and C. And how would we do the assignment? This is something that we will discuss. There is a sampler that I will show you. And this is something that you can start to look into to see what we are covering right now is making sense to you in terms of giving you knowledge to be able to do the task and activities. So if you go through the scenario, it says you've been hired by a company as a marketing, digital marketing executive, your uh, main uh, you know, task that has been given by the management team is that you're required to report back on these things. So as a scenario, as a background, what they've said is you need to prepare a comprehensive presentation, but the presentation is going to be looking at examining the role of digital and social media marketing strategies for a small medium enterprise company, 
in your country. So you might need to assume or look at an organization that you will take up as an example to carry through in the assignment. And then you're looking at discussing some of these tasks while you make the presentation for that particular company. And that is how we look at, uh, you know, discussing the assignment. But the assignment brief is already there, as I mentioned to you. And that's the second document that you can look at reading Hello. From, uh, just to familiarize yourself. Okay. Good stuff. So I'll catch up with you on Saturday then. And okay. about the learning outcome four. And then we'll look at if there is time after that session. We'll do a detailed discussion okay. how you compile this. And that'll be the, uh, that'll be the last uh, class for this. Digital yeah, and social media marketing, session. is that going to be the last class? For That's it? going to be the last class on Saturday. After that, we'll do assignment discussion and that will finish this unit. Yes. Saturday and I think subsequently after that, there'll be another class and that will be to discuss the assignment. That will